You know, the freedom of the psychoanalytic situation seems to me a freedom from that. That the question of why you think that is no longer a question of what further reasons do you have or being able to defend yourself. It's, it came into my mind. That's why, I mean, we can search together for why I thought that, but it's not the same. I don't have a response. My responsibilities are very different. Um, in the sense, my responsibility is just to speak my mind. It's not to defend what I thought, because the danger is that if I feel I need to defend what I thought, I'm going to start re repressing my speech, because I don't have reasons for what I thought. So, you know, I do think the two are related, and I think they're related in ways you bring up, but I also think that there are these, you know, differences that need to, and I want to make sure about honesty, that you're, what you mean by honesty is just the truthfulness of speaking your mind. And in that sense, I mean, I just thought, you know, there are a couple places you came in with some stuff about Trump, and it's not like I'm a defender of Trump's, but I'm not sure he isn't speaking his mind. You know, I, you know, I, whatever. I mean, guys, um, he, you know, what, I mean, who knows what's going on? I have no idea. But it's at least compatible with the evidence that he's just an impulsive talker of his mind. And in fact, he's confused the situations, you know. We, well, anyways, that's a... Um, but so the, the, the more, I think, let's say, substantive um, question I have, or thought I have, or let's say maybe even worry I have is, you know, the, the feature, I mean, John Dunn, um, um, that picture, I mean, so the picture of democracy is something everybody wants, is, um, you know, a few hundred years old. And, you know, back in Greece, there were a lot of people who thought, I mean, it was a, very, it was a pejorative term. I mean, it was a term that was associated with a bad thing. And, um, and part of the badness of it, for those who thought it was a bad thing, I think Plato would be such a person. Uh, he sort of gave a, what seemed to me a kind of psychoanalytic account of why democracy is so bad. And it was, the idea is that you know, the problem, you know, the, well, here's the thing. I mean, there's this value you and I share, which is this deep commitment to freedom of speech. And I do think we are, I, I'm passionate about it. But what he was worried about in democracy was that there's something, let's put it this way, in the most sympathetic way, there's something about freedom of speech that's just a little too close to desire for anybody's good. You know, it's sort of like the impulsiveness of hitting the send button, you know, in, in an angry email. You know, it's just really easy to write, you know, you, you know your, your fingers are close to the id and you type this angry email and then you hit send. And you oh, jeez, I mean, what a mess that I hit the send button, you know, it should have hit delete, but it's sent, now it's out there. I mean, there's that danger in democracy that the very thing we value, which is speech and freedom of speech, is too close to desire, and given the nature of human desire, it's too close to getting out of control. And so he thought, I mean, I think one of the worries Plato had about democracy was that the tendency towards tyranny is not some uh, external threat to democracy. It's internal. And there's something about democracy itself, and there's something about the freedom of speech that's going to lead us, we're going to lead us to demagogues, because it will lead to good speakers in the sense of good at, at appealing to our appetites or appealing to our fears. Um, and that this is just a worry about the limits of, of democracy or the dangers of free speech. And this is, I suppose, the place I suppose is the most substantial issue that I wanted you to talk about was that. Um, yeah, the danger of idealizing a kind of progressive picture of democracy, that if, you know, I couldn't agree with you more that there's been limitations and exclusions, and we've missed the female voice, and we've missed the voice of various oppressed groups, and I'm all in favor of inclusion and increasing those voices, but the idea that all that we have to worry about in democracy is the inclusion of, let's say, the space of the vagina in speech, or whatever it happens to be, whatever excluded speech, and we're going to be free of that problem that we've been living with. 
that's the worry that, I mean, I take that to be the platonic worry that, you know, we're, we got a problem that's really internal to democracy. And of course, we also have problems of exclusion. But the idea that we're going to solve the problems of democracy by including more is wishful. I mean, that's the worry, I think. And I think, you know, John, John um, you know, he talks about, he has this picture, as you said, the collapse of one exclusion after the other. And that may be true, but it just suggests a kind of progressive picture that I worry about is not actually accurate. Um, and then I'll just say one last piece of, um, which is, um, you know, when you actually get to su the suppression of free speech, I mean, right now, um, I, I wouldn't blame it on Trump. You know, I mean, from in the world I live in, um, the most aggressive attempts to shut down speech are from people who at least self-describe is on the left, not on the right. Um, I mean, I don't know that they are on the left, but their self-understanding is such. Um, so those are the sort of thoughts I have in listening to you. I just want to thank you very, very much for a wonderful talk. Okay. We'd like to respond to some of what you said before we see the oh, comments. Sure. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, so, I mean, there's much more in the book of, of, to, that covers some of these, these concerns, but I didn't... Um, well, first, I've never thought about how my patients... I mean, maybe when I'm in the room with a given patient, I think about that, but when I was thinking about that broad... Um, quest of, of psychoanalysis as, a, as, as uh, creating an emancipa emancipated minds and people who decide uh, are capable of contributing to the public sphere as um, that democratic arc. I hadn't thought about them reading my desire. Um, although, once you named it, it seemed very obvious. And in some ways, I'm very explicit with people in my practice about this because as people can claim their voice and their desire, um, they become more privileged people. They become semiotically capable. They become capable of being on... We, they've dismantled my authority sufficiently and claimed their own that we now are talking about an egalitarian, there's a shift out of our pre, prior hierarchy that's presumed in transference to a dismantling of that towards something resembling an inclusive egalitarian relationship that I would like to think of as a, as a democratic relationship. And the conversation then does become, and it's led explicitly by me it, it often enough, where. I will then say, well, now the bar is raised. Now you own your voice in a different way. What do you want to do with it? Like, what do you want to do to contribute to the world beyond you, right? Because we know the endless solipsism for our patients, and psychoanalysis has suffered from its own endless solipsism, where we only talk to each other. Um, so, and we see this in the public realm now, too, right? The left talks to, we talk to ourselves, the right talks to itself, and we see how the collapse of a space for shared discourse, which I know is a concern of yours, has come to be a lived reality, threatening the survival of uh, any intuitive notion of democracy or valid notion of democracy. Um, so I do encourage people to then, and this comes in part from Winnicott as well. You know, Winnicott says, that the patient needs to contribute in to a relationship. So how do we do that from a position of authenticity, of owning our genuine, authentic voice? Um, so, um, the, uh, so I'm not as worried about